All right, everybody, we're returning again, and we're first going to talk about the pharynx. So if you remember the pharynx, actually, let me get the pencil set up here. Okay, so if you remember the pharynx, let me erase this line here. The pharynx is another name for the throat. And we went over the three different parts of the pharynx, the nasopharynx, the oropharynx, and the laryngopharynx last time when we talked about the respiratory tract. So all three of these structures, as you know from our discussion of the respiratory tract, carry air. But only two of these structures are relevant when it comes to the digestive system uh, because only two of them carry food. And those parts of the pharynx are the oropharynx and the laryngopharynx. So speaking about food, the process of swallowing food is known as deglutition. So deglutition is just a fancy word for swallowing. That's where we're actually conveying the food uh, from the oral cavity into the pharynx, and then it's conveyed down into the esophagus where peristalsis takes over and the food is carried down to the stomach. So during this process of deglutition, the tongue is going to rise. So the tongue rises, the uvula closes off the nasopharynx, as we talked about before. The epiglottis seals off the glottis. So the glottis, by the way, is just the passageway that air travels through at the superior aspect of the pharynx, or I'm sorry, the larynx, rather, the voice box. So you know in the voice box, you got your true vocal cords and your false vocal cords. So you got the false vocal cords actually stacked on top of your true vocal cords. Well, that passageway, the space, the open space between those structures is known as the glottis. Remember, the epiglottis is this mucosa-bound flap of elastic cartilage that closes off the glottis when we swallow to prevent food from going down the wrong tube, so to say. The wrong tube is our trachea. So as a result, food is forced into the esophagus. So speaking of which, the esophagus, muscular tube, about 10 inches in length, lays posterior to the trachea, and its purpose is to convey the food from our pharynx down to our stomach. So we have two sphincters, and by the way, a sphincter is just a circular array of smooth muscle that uh, is at one end of a tubular organ, and the smooth muscle constricts so that we're able to occlude the passage, uh, in this case of foodstuffs, through this uh, uh, tubular organ. So again, obviously the esophagus is a muscular tube. The superior end of the esophagus is going to have an upper esophageal sphincter, right? Again, just a circular array of smooth muscle, um, whereas when the smooth muscle constricts, you seal off the tube, in this case, the esophagus. So when we swallow, what happens is, is the upper esophageal sphincter, which is normally constricted, loosens up to allow the food to pass through. So again, it opens up to let food enter during swallowing. Peristalsis, which is the process by which um, adjacent segments of smooth muscle along the length of the esophagus, embedded within the wall of the esophagus, contract rhythmically to be able to convey that food down to the stomach. Then once that food reaches the stomach, it reaches the lower esophageal sphincter, oftentimes clinically abbreviated as the LES. The LES is normally constricted to occlude the esophagus to prevent food from actually going from the esophagus to the stomach. And actually, I just misspoke previously. Its purpose is not to occlude the esophagus, but to occlude the passageway of food from the esophagus into the stomach. So normally it's constricted, but when we're swallowing, it loosens up and it allows the food 
to enter the stomach. All right, another term for the lower esophageal sphincter is the gastroesophageal sphincter, otherwise known as your cardiac sphincter. And that's going to be relevant when we talk about the cardiac region of the stomach, which is the region that's circumferential to uh, where the um, esophagus meets the stomach, where that cardiac sphincter is located. By the way, uh, the loosening of the lower esophageal sphincter, which basically happens in everyone who's over 40 years old. I'm getting up there. I'm 38 going on 39. Um, I haven't had any issues with this, but pretty much everybody, after they get into their fourth decade of life, they have problems with loosening of this lower esophageal sphincter leading to um, a disease, a very common disease or disorder is probably a better term for it, known as gastroesophageal reflex disease or GERD. Okay, so let's talk about the stomach. So the stomach is fairly straightforward. Place where food is stored, and also where digestion of food occurs as well. So uh, the stomach is located first off within the upper left quadrant of the abdominal pelvic cavity. And basically what happens here is as the food digests in the stomach and as the food is stored in the stomach, it is turned into this substance known as chyme and chyme has the consistency of a creamy paste. So there's four different areas or regions of the stomach that you have to uh, familiarize yourself with. And before we go that, I just want to uh, give a shout out to the tissue that lines the stomach. That is the epithelium that lines the stomach. It's simple columnar epithelium. By the way, the epithelium that lines the esophagus is largely stratified squamous epithelium, just like the epithelium that you find within much of your pharynx and within your oral cavity. However, once you get down to the level of the cardiac sphincter, your lower esophageal sphincter, you see a transition between the stratified squamous epithelium that dominates the esophagus and the simple columnar epithelium that continues on to line the entire inner lining of the stomach. So this is simple, and I forgot to write in columnar here. So this is simple columnar epithelium. So again, this is just a single layer of column-shaped cells all lined up in a row. Very neat and orderly. You guys remember that from AP1. So again, let's talk about the four different areas of the stomach or regions of the stomach. We have the cardia, fundus, body, and pylorus. So uh, the cardiac and the cardiac region or the cardia, other as it's otherwise known, is circumferential to the cardiac sphincter, right? The junction be between the esophagus and the stomach, and its main role is to secrete mucus. And the mucus is going to line the entire inner lining of the stomach and protect it from the very acidic contents of the stomach. So it secretes mucus. The fundus is the large domed region of the stomach. Whenever you see the word fundus, by the way, it describes some type of hollow organ that has a domed shaped region to it. Like we're going to talk about the fundus of the uterus coming up when we talk about the female reproductive system. So when you see the word fundus, you just think dome, all right? So this is kind of the domed or bowed out region of the stomach, which is mainly used for storage. Remember, a major purpose of the stomach is to store food. Well, this is where most of the food um, in the form of chyme is actually stored. The body of the stomach is going to be the main portion, the mid portion of the stomach. And the major purpose of the body is to secrete gastric juices, or we're just going to call them stomach secretions. And then finally, the tapered region, the most distal region of the stomach is called the pylorus. And the main purpose of the pylorus, or pyloric region as it's sometimes referred to, is to secrete the hormone gastrin.
All right. So once we get to the pylorus region, at the very distal end of the pylorus region, we have another sphincter called the pyloric sphincter. It's located between the stomach and the small intestine. So when stomach is suitably digested within the stomach, the pyloric sphincter opens up and then food goes into the first part of your small intestine known as your duodenum. Okay, so let's go down to the stomach diagram and name these different sections. So here you'll recognize here's the stomach. This dotted region right here with leader line number two refers to the cardiac sphincter, the region where the cardiac sphincter is, the junction between the esophagus and the stomach. This region right here uh, that is circumferential and approximate to the cardiac sphincter is known as the cardia. This lateral region that's domed is the fundus. This central region is the body. And then this tapered region, the most distal region, is the pylorus. Now I want you to pay attention to these arrows here. Let me change colors so we can do aquamarine. I'm going to embellish these arrows right here. So these arrows labeled four and seven follow the curvilinear contours of the stomach. So if we look at the curvilinear contours of the stomach here next to this uh, shorter set of arrows and compare it to the curvilinear surface of the stomach that is alongside this other set of arrows, we can immediately see that this region right here that I'm drawing, that I'm embellishing, is much more compact than this larger region right here that I'm drawing upon, that I'm embellishing, right? So these are the two curvatures of the stomach. The smaller, more compact curvature is known as the lesser curvature. It's the more medial or, or towards the midline. And then this larger curvature is the greater curvature. All right. So let's go back up to our notes right here where we give reference to the greater and lesser curvatures. So greater and lesser curvatures, these are just the um, uh, uh, medial and lateral curves respectively. It is the lesser omentum that attaches to the lesser curvature and it is the greater omentum that attaches to the greater curvature. So the omentums as you'll learn more about in lab are just stretches of mesentery. Well, what are mesenteries? Mesenteries are just sheets of peritoneum. You guys remember peritoneum? Peritoneum is that serous membrane that you find lining the outer boundaries and then enveloping the visceral organs within the abdominal pelvic cavity. So these particular sheets of mesentery, um, the greater omentum and lesser omentum, help tether together certain organs within the abdominal pelvic cavity. And the way it works is, is that the lesser omentum is a sheet of mesentery that basically connects the liver to the stomach at its lesser curvature. And then the greater omentum hangs down from the greater curvature of the stomach like this big fatty apron because it has lots of adipose tissue embedded within its center and then curves upon itself to then attach to your transverse colon, which we've already given reference to and we talked about a big overview of the digestive system. So we'll talk more about that when we get to the large intestines. Right, but that's how that all comes together. That's how it works. And you'll see examples of that on the models in lab. Okay, so that's all we want to give reference to that for now. So let's talk about the rugae. The rugae are the large internal longitudinal folds that you find on the inner lining of the stomach. And a lot of times, whenever you see folds along the digestive system, uh, people assume that they're there to increase the surface area for reabsorption. And that is largely the case, but it is not the case when it comes to the rugae. And oftentimes, this is the setup for a lot of trick multiple choice questions where um, we'll ask you, you know, what is the purpose of the rugae? And one of the 
answers may be, oh, to increase the surface area for reabsorption. That doesn't make any sense, though, because there is no reabsorption going on in the stomach. All right? The purpose of the rugae instead is just to allow for distension or the increasing of volume of the stomach. The increasing, or another way to think about it, is the increasing of size of the stomach. So distension of the stomach. So it folds. These folds, rather, are there to accommodate the distension or increasing volume or increasing size of the stomach. Now, there's three layers of smooth muscle lining the stomach. And these uh, three layers of, of smooth muscle are part of the layer known as the muscularis layer. And we're going to talk about the different tunics or layers of the GI tract that are characteristic throughout the alimentary canal. Throughout most of the alimentary canal, you have two layers of smooth muscle in this muscularis layer, but in the stomach, you actually have three layers. And I'm going to switch back to the red again. I'll take the opportunity to do that. Okay, so uh, let's talk about the different types of secretory cells of the stomach. First of all, we have the zymogenic cells, otherwise known as chief cells, which produce pepsinogen. And you're going to talk more about pepsinogen in your GI physiology lab, and then also I'll talk about it in our um, uh, physiology of digestion le uh, lecture, rather, coming up. So pepsinogen is a proenzyme, meaning it's a precursor of an enzyme called pepsin. Pepsin is going to break apart peptide bonds, as the name suggests, and the peptide bonds are going to be between the amino acids within a protein. So this enzyme ultimately is going to play a role in breaking down proteins into their subunit molecules, which are amino acids. So again, breaking down or digesting proteins into amino acids. Goblet cells are going to produce mucus. Again, we have the mucus uh, secreted to protect the lining of the stomach, to protect the lining of the stomach from the acidic contents of the stomach. Uh, parietal cells uh, are going to produce the hydrochloric acid, which the mucus is secreted to protect the lining of the stomach from, and then also intrinsic factor. So what is intrinsic factor? Intrinsic factor is very important clinically. Intrinsic factor helps with the digest, or rather, I'm sorry, not digestion. I'm saying the word digestion too much, getting ahead of myself here, or carried away with myself, rather. So it helps with the absorption of vitamin B12, or cobalamin, in the small intestine. And this actually happens in the last part of the last part of your small intestine, a place called the terminal ileum. And as we get older, our stomach makes less and less intrinsic factor. So people who are in their 70s, 80s, 90s, etc., cetera, um, oftentimes are deficient of vitamin B12 because they are deficient of intrinsic factor. And that's why a lot of times it's common to see elderly people get vitamin B12 shots every month. All right. So by the way, the hydrochloric acid plays an important role uh, with regards to pepsinogen. So basically what happens is, is the pepsinogen gets converted to the enzyme pepsin, which I just referred to, by the hydrochloric acid. Another important thing that the hydrochloric acid is going to do is it's just generally going to denature proteins. In other words, unfold them. So it unfolds the proteins to increase total surface area. SA is an abbreviation for surface area. to help with chemical digestion. Remember, in chemical digestion, we're taking big molecules and we're breaking them down into smaller molecules. In this case, we're taking big proteins and we're breaking them down into their 
subcomponent parts. So that is breaking pig proteins down into polypeptides and then breaking those polypeptides down into the uh, subunit molecule, the most basic subunit molecule, which is the amino acid. Does that make sense to everybody? Another thing that the hydrochloric acid does, incidentally, is kill bacteria as well. So it serves a lot of different roles, um, some involved with uh, protecting us against microbes, and then others involved with uh, the uh, beginning of the digestion process. All right, so moving on to the small intestine. By the way, did we fill in all these leader lines here for the stomach? Yep, looks like we got them all. You also notice here on this diagram that it does show the three different layers of the stomach. So maybe I'll color those in for you to make that a little bit more apparent. So right here, here's one layer that was chopped in half for some reason. And here you can see here's its other component on the other side. So that's the outermost layer. And then here we have the middle layer. And then finally, here's the innermost layer. I guess we'll just go with red for that. Again, throughout most of the alimentary canal, you only have two smooth muscle layers, or two layers of what's known in its, in its entirety as the muscularis layer. And again, we'll get to that when we talk about the different tunics or layers of the alimentary canal. All right, so that's just a little side note. Yep, this is red, we wanna stick with that. Good, so moving on, small intestine. So small intestine is named for its diameter uh, relative to that of uh, its compatriot intestine, the large intestine. Uh, it is the longest segment of the digestive tract and extends from the pyloric sphincter, which is that sphincter between the stomach and the first part of the small intestine, to the ileocecal valve. So let me write that in for you. So it extends from the pyloric sphincter. I don't know if you guys can hear this in the background. The uh, kind of clicking sound is my 11-year-old dachshund getting very antsy. This is kind of his witching hour, I guess. Uh, so I'll have to see where that goes. I just took him outside, so I don't know what the issue is. I think he's just bored as we all are, right? So uh, this uh, is the longest segment, again, of the digestive tract. extends from the pyloric sphincter, which is a sphincter between the stomach and the intestine, and all the way to this other sphincter that ends the small intestine. It's at the transition between the small intestine and the large intestine, and this sphincter is called the ileocecal valve. Again, I'm going to emphasize the fact that this is a sphincter. So most digestion and most absorption, this is very important, most absorption, especially absorption of nutrients, occurs here in the small intestine. Again, I want to emphasize there is no absorption going on in the stomach. The stomach is just for storage and digestion. And then the small intestine is where most of the digestion occurs and most of the absorption in the GI tract. So it consists of three different parts for a grand total length of about 21 feet. So we have the first part, which is a short little stubby part called the duodenum, which is only about 10 inches long. Uh, the middle part is the jejunum, which is only 8 feet long compared to the longest component, which is the ileum, which I've already alluded to, which is 12 feet long. 
So we do see modifications in the four different tunics or layers um, where they take on uh, different meanings or different functions in the different specialized components of the small intestine. Uh, so the circular folds, the, the innermost uh, uh, concentric folds that you find um, that are seen from the perspective of the lumen or the hollow cavity within the small intestines are called the plique circularis. And as a result of having these kind of inner uh, groove-like folds, it allows the chyme to actually spiral through the lumen. And as a result, we slow down the food and increase its contact with the inner lining of the small intestine. Again, these folds are found within the inner lining of the stomach. So the innermost layer of the stomach. What is it? What do you want? You're going to have to wait. You're, it's fine. You're fine. You got food. You got water. You're fine. No, we're not going to play. All right. So in addition to that, on the inner lining of the stomach, we also see it thrown out into these finger-like extensions known as villi. Again, when we talk about the different tunics of the alimentary canal, we'll, we'll talk about villi in a little bit more depth. But anyways, just suffice it to say, there are these little uh, frond-like or, or finger-like uh, projections that face within the inner lumen of the small intestine. You can see them with the naked eye. If you cut open a small intestine, like when I used to uh, teach at MVCC in Utica, we had a, um, an actual specimen of a cat's intestine that we had splayed out for the students and they could see that the inner lining actually looks like shag carpet. And that shag carpet-like texture actually comes from these villi. And the purpose why we have these villi is to increase the surface area for reabsorption. So this is a case where this inner texture is there to increase the surface area for reabsorption. By the way, the singular of villi, or villi is going to be villus. That's going to be the singular. So just one of these finger-like projections is going to be um, referred to as a villus. And again, the purpose here is increasing the surface area for uh, reabsorption of nutrients. Now, when you look at the columnar cells lining the alimentary canal, remember we talked about them when we talked about them lining the stomach. Well, they continue to line the intestines. If you look at their apical surface, or that surface that faces the inner lumen of the intestines, that apical surface is thrown out into these microscopic finger-like projections known as microvilli. Now, the microvilli you cannot see with the naked eye. They do not look like a shag carpet. You can't see them. You have to have um, a compound microscope on oil immersion to see them clearly, or using a more sophisticated sophisticated type of microscope. So the term we want you to know here is microvilli. Now, when you look at a microscopic image or a histological micrograph of uh, the tissue of the small intestine, these microvilli almost look like bristles on a brush. As a result, this surface is sometimes referred to as the brush border. And the enzymes that are actually tethered to this apical surface of these uh, simple columnar epithelial cells are referred to as brush border enzymes. So whenever you see the term brush border enzyme, it's referring to some type of enzyme that's actually tethered to or connected to that apical surface or innermost surface of these columnar cells lining the intestine. So in addition to having these uh, various uh, innermost structural components uh, to the lining of the stomach, we also have these deep invaginations of, did I say the stomach? I'm sorry, the, the lining of the intestines. We also have these deep invaginations known as intestinal crypts. And the purpose of these intestinal crypts is to secrete intestinal juices 
They secrete so much juice, it's about one to two liters produced every day. Tremendous amount of fluid. Uh, the major uh, stimulus for the secretion of this fluid is just the stretch or irritation of the um, intestines. The intestinal juice, uh, juice rather, is largely water and mucus. Uh, it doesn't have a lot of enzymes in it, however, because the enzymes are actually found tethered or attached to the apical surface of the columnar epithelial cells lining the intestines. Remember, these enzymes are actually attached to the surface and therefore are known as the brush border enzymes. Now you guys remember the mucosa associated lymphoid tissue. Well, again, we have mucosa associated lymphoid tissue in the small intestine. We know it as the Peyer's patches. And we talked all about that when we talked about the lymphatic system. So again, this is just one specialized region in the body where we have mucosa associated lymphoid tissue. Another region that we also gave reference to would be up in the pharynx, where we have uh, the various tonsils and the oral pharynx. We have the palatine tonsils and the nasal pharynx. We have the pharyngeal tonsils, etc. Right. Well, these are basically like the tonsils of the small intestine. It's basically the same thing. It's just these scattered um, patches or islands, if you will, of lymphoid tissue. So again, take the examples of the malt. Malt stands for mucosa associated lymphoid tissue. So the epithelium, the simple columnar epithelium, um, is highly mitotic, meaning it divides constantly. Uh, it renews itself about every three to six days. Uh, and as a result of this, um, the rapid mitosis can make diseases of the small intestine uh, difficult to treat, especially uh, when you're dealing with uh, different types of uh, cancers of the intestine. All right? uh, whenever you have some type of very uh, mitotically active tissue, because the molecular machinery um, that's involved with mitosis is always revved up. There's, there's always a lot of these different proteins that are involved with timing the cell cycle. Uh, you always increase your risk of something going wrong. And as a result, that's why um, the GI tract is a uh, frequent uh, place where you see different types of uh, cancers originate from. And then other disorders as well. And the, the other disorders ultimately um, the difficulty in treating them and um, their likelihood for occurring is tied back to the fact that um, the uh, division cycles um, in the cells here occur so rapidly. So now let's talk about the large intestine. Extends from the ileocecal valve to the anus. Remember the ileocecal valve is in fact a sphincter. It's a sphincter located between the small intestine and the large intestine. So this is the term we want you to insert here. Ileocecal valve. So there's four different areas of the large intestine. The first bag-like component or, or pouch-like component of the um, large intestine is called your cecum. By the way, your veriform appendix, which I pointed out to you when we did the, the overview of the digestive system, is attached to the cecum. So the, the veriform appendix is just this uh, tubular structure with a blind end that is continuous with or connected with uh, the cecum. It's actually inferior to the cecum in its connection with it. Then we have the colon, and the colon is split up into four different segments. We have the ascending of colon, the first part, the part in which the uh, foodstuffs is actually going to move superiorly. Then the uh, large intestine takes a dog leg turn, which we know as the hepatic flexure, which we'll get to coming up shortly when we diagram out the large intestine. Uh, at which point it gives way to your transverse colon, the horizontally uh, oriented part of your colon. And then the colon takes another 90 degree dog leg turn uh, at a, a flexure, a turning point known as your splenic fracture, the splenic flexure that is. And then the foodstuffs goes uh, inferiorly through your descending colon. And then your descending colon gives rise to the S-shaped colon or sigmoid colon. Remember, sigmoid literally means S-shaped. 
All right, so let's talk about different uh, overall characteristics of our large intestine. Our large intestine is only five feet in length. And by the way, let me back up here. So the last parts of the large intestine are the rectum and the anal canal. Some textbooks will actually refer to the rectum and the anal canal as being their own entities and not actually connected to the large intestine. You can think about it either way. Uh, nature doesn't think about these structures as being um, organized or, or sub-organized in any particular way. They are what they are. Um, it's us human beings that... Um, name them and organize them in different ways. So as far as this organization um, mode is concerned, you don't have to worry yourselves. Uh, you, you can consider the rectum and anal canal to be their own entities, or you can consider them to be bunched in um, as being part of the large intestine. So a, another important anatomical um, characteristics that you find throughout the large intestine are the tinea coli, which you'll see in the lab models. These are just longitudinal arrangements of smooth muscle arranged as three bands which run along the length of the large intestine, They're highly characteristic from the outer surface of the large intestine. Now, uh, the tinea coli actually result in crimping the uh, large intestine into these pocket-like sacs known as hostra. So the hostra are a series of pouches allowing the foodstuffs to pass from pouch to pouch, resulting in the uh, sequential formation of the feces. So as the foodstuffs travels along, it kind of sits for a while in the orderly formation or orderly arrangement of um, pouches. And as a result, you have more time for it to dehydrate. And as the, the foodstuffs progressively dehydrates, it uh, progressively becomes the hardened feces, which is finally is um, uh, expelled from the large intestine through the anal canal and anus. So functions of the large intestines. Completes absorption, so the, there is the absorption of some nutrients, especially vitamins here. There are no new enzymes introduced, however. So there, there's really not a lot of digestion going on per se. If there is any digestion going on, it's because of carryover from enzymes that um, uh, came in at different levels of the GI tract that preceded the large intestine. The large intestine also plays a role in manufacturing vitamins. So some vitamins are actually created de novo and they're actually made by the resident bacteria, the natural resident bacteria, otherwise known as our flora, our natural flora, as it's sometimes referred to. So again, these vitamins are made de novo, meaning they're made from scratch, from natural resident bacteria, aka means otherwise known as flora or our natural flora, F-L-O-R-A. All right, so let's get to some labeling here. This is pretty straightforward. Uh, 14 is going to be your ileum. This last part of your ileum is specifically referred to as your terminal ileum, by the way. Number three is going to be your cecum. This worm-like extension inferior to your cecum, of course, is going to be our appendix, otherwise referred to as our veriform appendix. Remember, the prefix, or I should say the word preceding uh, appendix, uh, veriform, refers to worm-like. So literally, the veriform appendix is the worm-like appendix. But if you just use the term appendix, that's fine as well. That's what most people refer to it as. Two is going to be your A sending a colon. or I should say just ascending colon. I added another vowel in there. Where your ascending colon takes a dog leg turn to become the transverse colon, which is this longitudinal 
stretch of your colon. This flexure point is known as the hepatic flexure, and it's known as the hepatic flexure because of its proximity to the liver. So you got your big liver right here. Actually, I drew it stretched over a little bit too far. Get rid of that. Actually, let's change colors so it's a little bit less distracting. Let's do the liver in purple. All right. So you got your big liver, largest gland in the body, right about here, in approximation to everything else. So the hepatic flexure, this duglic turn in your large intestine that's most uh, approximate to your liver is known as your hepatic flexure. So then when the large intestine takes another 90 degree dog-like turn, where it transitions from the transverse colon to the descending colon, which is number nine, We call this turning point the splenic flexure because of its proximity to the spleen. So let's use another color for the spleen. Let's do the spleen in green, although that's really more appropriate for the gallbladder. Eh, let's do like this fuchsia color for the spleen. So you're going to have your spleen somewhere over here like this, all right? So this flexure again is close to your spleen, so it's referred to as the splenic flexure. All right, so moving inferiorly, here we can see the descending colon giving rise to our sigmoid colon, or the S-shaped colon. And then finally, here we can see the sigmoid colon giving rise to our rectum. The whole purpose of the rectum, by the way, is just storage of feces. That's all it does. It's just the kind of uh, storage depot for the feces before it's ready to unload through the anal canal, which has two sphincters lining it, and then finally out through the exit point, which is the anus. All right, so I think that um, we covered everything. Oh, by the way, there all are alternative terms for the hepatic flexure versus the splenic flexure, just in case your lab instructor refers to them. just because it contrasts with the red. So the platic, the hepatic flexure rather is also known as your right colic flexure because it's on the right side. And the splenic flexure is also known as your left colic flexure because it's on the left. And I think you should know both. All right, so the next up is the liver, and I have no idea how long we've gone here, but I'm guessing it's been about at least 30 minutes, but maybe not, we'll see. But anyways, I wanna call it right here, and then we'll do another lecture video on the liver and the pancreas. And it looks like we're moving right along here. All right, everybody, I'll see you soon.